Hi, and welcome to the Clayton Newt's Generative AI Vodcast Series. I'm your host, Will Howe. I lead Clayton Newt's data analytics team, where we're building with generative AI and this new technologies. Um, really exciting episode planned today, where we'll cover a whole bunch of interesting topics around privacy. Uh, very pleased to be joined by two of my colleagues. Uh, first is Stephen Klimt. Stephen is a partner of many years standing in our financial service regulatory practice, which includes privacy. His many years of experience giving advice on privacy matters in relation to changing business practice of his clients, on differing data flows, uh, disclosure documents, policies, and including in relates to complaints made to the OAIC. He's been a member of the Law Council of Australia's Privacy Committee since it was formed. Um, also joining me is Lyndall Civil. Uh, Lyndall is a special counsel in our technology and intellectual property practice. Uh, her practice is uh, centered around complex technology transformations. She's a particular interest in data. Lyndall studied and later practiced for many years in London, where she helped a number of clients implement the GDPR. So she has firsthand influence on that. Lyndall worked closely with clients on privacy, data commercialization, and data governance matters. So uh, thank you and welcome, Stephen and Lyndall. Very excited to have you on for this. And maybe let's start by kind of having a bit of a conversation about data and how this is fueled by data. And so maybe let's have a think about the bones of where this all comes from. Lyndall, it's all about the data, isn't it? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. You know, we, we're all getting swept up in it, right? It's super exciting, even this week with the the um, the launch or the, you know, the announcement around GPT-4. It, it's super exciting all the, to think about these products, but I think sometimes we forget just how they're constructed and what you need to build a product like this. And it's very much the case that these sorts of products exist because they are, they are as you said, well, they're fueled by data. So they have immense language models that sit behind these products and and to to create it and make it work you need to first establish it through lots and lots of data but then you also need to, to to have the ability to improve you need to keep 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 ingesting more and more and more um to to build a solution and a product um that that works effectively so it's pretty amazing to think about that um, of course there's pitfalls in everything right you know if you're thinking about how to construct these things and how much data was consumed you know even initially to build these sorts of products it's absolutely immense and it's highly likely that personal information comprises a set of that it's you know it'd be really difficult to argue that there wasn't some personal information that was swept up um, in that process it's um you know, even when we think about, I think even going forward, you know, it's all, we're tech lawyers, we get super exciting when we see new product launches and things like that. But you think about GPT-4, right? That's even stretching it further. It's looking now at photographs and images and all sorts of things. So it's an absolute array of data um, that's coming into play. And some of it is certainly personal information. Um, you know, something that I kind of am still grappling with and, you know, particularly when we put more of an ethics lens on or a human rights lens and um, and certainly a privacy lens, which Stephen and I are going to talk to you today, is, is very much about, you know, how is that done? You know, it's not like OpenAI rang me up and said, excuse me, Lyndall, can I please have some of your data to, to build this product? So it, it's it's a question there's a question there um, about that sort of thing and you know there's different ways of thinking about it there's obviously lawful elements potentially unlawful elements um, but then again you know is, is it the right way way to do things um, and how can people confirm what data of theirs is is in these solutions well and to that point I mean surely it's already covered under some of the existing regimes uh, Stephen, from your perspective, how does the Privacy Act apply to this generative AI? Well, generative AI essentially works in in in, in, a, in many senses by effectively scraping data from various sources, and that data is, as Lindell pointed out, likely to include personal information. Or I'd put it slightly differently: it's going to be very difficult to exclude personal information from the data that's scraped. And, and this is either done directly or by virtue of ag aggregating the different sources of the information scraped. And so Gen AI and, and, it, and potentially its users will be subject to the Privacy Act if personal information is collected. So, and what that means is it has to be stored somewhere 
for a point in time rather than merely being accessed. And there'll be issues as to, it may well be that Gen AI itself doesn't store anything, but it's close, but the people who use it do. But in any event, it's highly likely that there will be some collection of personal information. And so if personal information is collected, that's when the Privacy Act steps in. Then there's all sorts of obligations under the Privacy Act that need to be considered by those who are collecting information in the course of using um, artificial intelligence. So if, for example, the information collected is sensitive information, and sensitive information is information about a person's political beliefs, it's health information about a person, it's information about a person's religion, it's biometric information, it's all sorts of, there are a, a number of other things too. Generally, that information under the current Australian privacy law can only be consent collected with the individual's consent. So if you've got an AI application that's collecting information, and it may even be aggregating information to create information that's sensitive information, how will you ensure that the data subject concerned, the individual concerned, has given consent? Similarly, there's an obligation that personal information must be collected directly from an individual unless it's unreasonable or impracticable to do so. And with AI and it's scraping information from various sources and individuals probably have no idea that um, the personal information is being, co is being collected through an AI application, let alone how it's being used by an AI application. And so then users of AI, uh, of Gen AI, need to say, well, it's unreasonable and impracticable to use that to, to collect the information directly from the individual. Then there's, sorry, Lyndall. I was just going to say, I heard this really interesting thing the other day where someone, you know, stepping aside from the pure legal side of things, they called it extraction fairness. And I hadn't really thought about it that way before, but it's interesting to think. And I think some people think because, you know, some of the things you've mentioned, Stephen, then, you know, some people think, oh, it's publicly available, so it's okay. Like it's it's no longer personal information or personal data. And in some jurisdictions that can be the case, but it's few and far between, you know, in, in most cases, just because something's publicly available and, you know, it's being scraped or whatever it may be, doesn't it doesn't detract from the fact that it still is personal information. No, not a, a, absolutely. Mm. And, and I'll I'll probably talk I'll talk later on a little bit about the proposed reforms, and that'll be the definition of personal information. We even expanded mm -hmm. to capture information that's collected. Well, so, when we talk about this personal information that is being captured, obviously there's the scraping process where they train the model, but we as users are actually typing information into the system as we go and. Lyndall, um, notwithstanding the fact that obviously the law does need to catch up in some areas around this, um, what information are we actually putting in there? And to Stephen's point, how does the Privacy Act apply? Yeah, it's interesting. And and um, yeah, people would have seen a, a stark improvement on OpenAI's privacy policy a couple of days ago to to deal with this in a in a more um, compliant manner. Um, but certainly that's, you know, it's something on our minds, particularly as lawyers, you know, we're always chasing down risk rabbit holes. And, and that's something that we're constantly thinking about, you know, the, the Gen AI, it's interesting, it's fantastic, you know, it's, it's got so many amazing applications, but we just have to be really conscious about what prompts, you know, what, what information we're putting in there and what our clients are putting in there. And that may change over time, you know, it, it depends, we might have our own instance of these products going forward where we can ensure that there's appropriate data governance around it, and we can lock it down and, and make sure that we uh, that the products comply or assist us to on our compliance journey. But at the moment, you know, I certainly tremble in my boots um, thinking about perhaps what people are inputting into this. Um, and I think in the latest version, so I, there's been a lot of pushback around this, right, about transparency and what these sorts of players are doing with information that's being input. And before it wasn't particularly clear, I think OpenAI and others took the view that, look, it's not really our problem. We're being really clear about it. You need to be careful as a user. But I think now they've appreciated the backlash and are starting to 
to change, I'm not sure their ways might be too broad, but certainly in terms of their documentation, they, they're starting to indicate quite clearly the types of personal information that is being collected. And they made it a lot clearer, particularly since I think Tuesday, around how that's going to be used. And it's very apparent that anything you put in there is, as I sometimes say, a bit of a free for all. Like you, you, it's very hard to get back um, and to, to potentially make changes to it. And it's certainly going to be used. And in the, um, the new privacy policy for OpenAI, as an example, it makes it clear that it's not going to just be used to improve the existing product. It's going to be, it potentially can be used to create new products con and conduct certain other activities. So it's something to be incredibly mindful of um, as we all go on this journey um, of using these new products. And you certainly don't want to be left behind. You know, I think some people are too risk adverse um, around this, but it's just making sure that we're sensible and appreciate the risk and put appropriate um, governance in place. Um, I did notice a quirk, which I think I mentioned um, to you, Will, the other day about how, um, as OpenAI as an example, had previously put in there something around how they may share some of your actions with other users. I did notice that that's been removed. Um, so I suspect as part of the, um, the feedback that's been received is that was perhaps going a little too far or wasn't clear enough um, in terms of a uh, onward use or you know future use of information that's been input into the product but i was i was going i mean i think that brings out an important point one of the obligations under the current legislation is to give a disclosure notice um at or before the time personal information is collected or if it's not reasonably practical to do so do it as soon as practical afterwards um and amongst the things that need to be contained in the notice is the organizations or entities to whom the information, the personal information is usually disclosed. And so, I mean, a number of points arise in connection with um, Gen AI and AI, gen, and AI generally in relation to that. So if information is being scraped uh, from various sources as part of Gen, uh, as part of, um, gen AI, how do you give um, individuals concerned, the APP5 notices, and you, 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 it doesn't sound like it's terribly, you're terribly, it's terribly uh, an easy thing to do, and you maybe fall back on the it's not practicable to do so. But then, even if it is, and even in relation to users, if information collected is dis can be disclosed, there's potentially, I don't know, almost an unlimited means of disclosure of information that's collected depending upon um, how users choose to use it. And so how do you possibly encompass all the disclosures that could have been made? Mm -hmm. So APP5 notices in the context of Gen AI and, and AI applications more generally are very tricky things to deal with. And uh, I'm not certain it's probably, it may be an accurate assumption, uh, but for, um, for chat GPT, for example, to say, I'm not going to disclose your personal information that you put, you give me in order to establish an account to third parties is one thing. But in terms of information obtained through use of the application, maybe another, another thing completely. Well, it's interesting some of that change. And uh, Linda, you talked about how the open AI privacy policy has changed recently. And uh, sometimes the technology companies um, have been accused of of moving quickly before the law has caught up to them. And, and maybe this is that growing and maturing a little bit. And I guess here in Australia, we actually have our own legislative change coming up. And Stephen, be interested in your thoughts. We've got some foreshadowed amendments to the Privacy Act. How do you think that's going to impact generative AI? The Attorney General released a paper a month or so ago setting, saying that this is the intention of what should be done. And that's, that's open for comment at the moment. They've intentionally said... We're not going to specifically deal with and regulate AI directly. That's for another day, and that's going to be dealt with separately. But there's all sorts of provisions in there and all sorts of reforms that will impact upon um, open AI um, and gen AI anyway. First thing is there's going to be a general fair and reasonable standard for the, the handling of personal information. So therefore, um, 
the way that you would think that could potentially it has, has, has to bear upon the how would have some bearing upon the way in which the AI application ap actually operates because in terms of collecting personal information and what it does with the personal information you would if there are no parameters built in there to ensure that it's handled fairly and reasonably then those using it and those potentially even providing the software may be breaching the legislation similarly there's an obligation for privacy risk privacy impact assessments for high risk activities so again users and that depending upon the way in which it's used it may impact it may require a privacy impact assessment mm. there's obligations to record the purposes of collection before at the time of collection that's what's proposed and so again when you're collecting um, information through ai you don't necessarily know the purpose of collection at all before the time you collect it the proposals also refer to automated decision making um, systems, which of which AI could be part. And they say they should be described in privacy policies and individuals have rights, the rights to request meaningful information about how the automated decisions are made. Um, the proposed legislation also deals with targeting of individuals or targeting of individuals based upon characteristics and says that individuals should be given an unqualified right to opt out of targeting. Now, how could they possibly be given such a right, or how would such a right work in the context of an AI application that potentially doesn't even at the start have any idea of the individuals concerned who may be the subject of targeting? And then finally, there's specific obligations in relation to de-identified data that's held. There's obligations to breach to data breach report, breaches of data breaches in relation to unidentified, de-identified data. And there's also obligations to um, to take reasonable steps to, to, to there's, there will also be proposed obligations to destroy or destroy de-identified data. So again, or delete de-identified data. Again, that would present significant challenges in, in the AI context. So really, it will be interesting to see how these developments pan out and what's ult what ultimately turns into law, but um, it probably creates a great deal of um, legislative obligations that people involved in AI, either developing it, creating it, selling it, or using it will need to be conscious of and it may even be a case of um, of the law, even current regulation, not really being up to speed with um, developments in the marketplace. So it sounds like there's a lot of change and uncertainty. Uh, Lyndall, I guess, from your perspective, what do we do with all this change? Yeah, it's, it's tricky. And I think I think I think that is it actually. It is tricky. You know, it's certainly in Australia, um, and we're not alone. And this happens all the time, right? You know, technology advances and the law can't keep up. Um, it, it lingers behind and it's that constant challenge of trying to to you know, it really struggles um to keep pace with technology. And I I think um you know, I I, I think that with that, um obviously. It, it, it really needs to be some, there needs to be something there, right, to give everyone confidence around these sorts of products. So, and that's not just from a user perspective, that's also from the developer perspective and from, you know, a commercial perspective that at the moment, because there isn't really any specific AI regulation in Australia, um, it can be challenging for both sides to work out what to do and what the parameters are um, around how to, to use and develop these technologies. I think at the moment, you know, we're talking about privacy today and there's, there's obviously other um, regimes that touch on AI. So there's things like discrimination law, um, surveillance law, those sorts of things will 
also um, at the moment, you know, deal with AI because a lot of those sorts of um, laws are technology agnostic. So they are drafted in a certain way that if a new technology comes along, you can slot it in and AI is regulated um, through those mechanisms. But there is a real push, you know, there is a real drive to think about and to contemplate actually having some AI specific um, regulation in Australia. And this is something that's been floating around for some time. It's not just because of chat GPT or other things. It's been flagged um, from various elements of society, um, both from developer, you know, from developers, but also from, you know, things like the Human Rights Commission and those, those sorts of elements as well to say, look, we really need to, to have a think about this because, you know, a lot of AI will be completely not a problem, right? You know, m many AI applications, just it, it doesn't matter, they're super low risk, but there's always that that moment that there are those elements and perhaps like in the generative AI space where things are higher risk and they can have a detrimental effect on society in a way, positive and negative, like anything in life. Um, but that's where you really need the regulation to kick in and to provide some parameters around, around these sorts of things. And, and this is really important, particularly for vulnerable people, for instance, um, safety, you know, online harms, all these sorts of things. Um, it all feeds into the discussion about what we should do around AI regulation. Um, you know, Australia, we, we like to observe um, sometimes what's happening in other jurisdictions, and we're certainly observing what's happening um, in Europe at the moment with the AI Act. And, and it's interesting because the AI Act is taking a very risk-based approach to these things. A new category swanned in um, a couple of weeks ago, so I think there's now five categories um, perhaps there, but they are certainly um, range from, you know, prohibited essentially things that are, are too out there, right? They're, they're dangerous, um, things that are prohibited. So AI systems that are prohibited. And then you move in, you move down the scale. So you move to high risk, you know, and, and then low risk and, and so on and so on. So, and there has been some discussion about where does Gen AI fit in this space? You know, is it one of those ones that arguably could be high risk, but is it all the time? So I think that's put a bit of a spanner in the works for our European colleagues at the moment, um, particularly the European Commission about how to deal with this because because they're really trying to bed down the AI Act at the moment um, and get that out. It's, you know, it was meant to be a Christmas present, but now it's stepping into first quarter, second quarter, and, and so on. So I think it's, um, it's an interesting space to be in, and it's not easy. AI regulation is not easy, trying but to I'll, balance it out. Yeah, but I, I would say there's unfortunately a natural tendency of regulators to say, well, we've got to get something in. So the Europeans are rushing to get some AI legislation in place. And what regulators tend to do is they tend to say, okay, well, I'm just going to put that in and not really consider where it fits in the overall context of um, regulation. And so take the privacy regulation. Privacy regulation may impact or is likely to impact upon AI in a, a number of different ways that we've discussed today. But if there's separate AI legislation, I think that separate AI legislation should be formulated having regard to what's in the privacy legislation, any other legislation that affects AI. And to the extent that you want the AI, separate AI legislation to cover the field, then you should repeal or ameliorate the aspects of the other legislation so that it still also doesn't apply. Simply slotting in a new piece of legislation on top of an existing regime and not changing the existing regime, I think is very lazy regulation. And I think in our rush to doing things, there's a real risk that that, will, that could happen. Well, I don't, I don't know if there's been a, a rush per se. I think it's been going on for quite some time in Europe, that's for sure. And that makes sense, right? Because you have so many member states that need to contribute to that debate um, and repercharge and, and do certain things. But it will be interesting to see if there's a rush in other jurisdictions to, to catch up in a way or to, to manage um, the environment that we're in now because AI is it's, it's here and it's interesting and it's popular and, you know, I can imagine well, um, that some well, regulators Euro are thinking about well, it. Well, the Europeans in, um, in relation to AI regulation try and do what they've done with privacy, which is essentially try and impose a European standard on the entire world because that's, that's effectively the European approach in the GDPR. And it's an approach that we in Australia in privacy appear to be, to appear to be buying hook, line and sinker. 
And I think it's something that from a client perspective, we're certainly having questions about, you know, this is coming in Europe. It has long tentacles. You know, for an example of a long tentacle is that even if, you know, the AI system is here in Australia, everything's done in Australia, the entities in Australia, but if the output is used in the EU, then it's captured um, by the AI Act. So I think that's certainly on, on lawyers' minds and, and everyone out there as to how do we prepare for this um, coming forward. There's going to be a long, you know, 12 month implementation period, yeah. obviously a 36 month for other elements of the AI Act as well. But it, but it's certainly, certainly interesting. Um, I'm excited to see what happens. Clearly, there's a lot ahead here. So um, I think we just got a chance to just scratch the surface. So no doubt more to come in the conversation around privacy and emerging legislation. Uh, but thank you to Lyndall and Stephen for the conversation today around privacy. Thank you to our watchers and our listeners for being on this journey with us. And we've got a number of other great episodes planned within this general, this generative AI vodcast series. So look forward to seeing you at the next one.